Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. On today, we have Ali Akmadian. He is the CEO of Helio, Helio Spectra. Oh, there, we couldn't count to 10, and now I can't even say the name of the company. Helio Spectra. He brought passion for people and technology with 22 years of international business leadership experience to the position at the helm of Helio Spectra. Ali is globally recognized for his successful track record of developing new businesses and developing profitable growth in a multitude of geographies. So he works around the world, folks. He has lived and worked in six different countries on three different continents. Over the course of his career, he is highly skilled in integrating cultural and commercial experiences. He excels in establishing partnerships with different stakeholders and driving diverse teams to peak performance. Prior to joining Helio Spectra, Ali was Vice President of Asia and Oceania for Tetra Pak. Never heard of those guys. And served as a member of Tetra Pak's global executive team. Ali has an MS, I guess that's a master's in engineering. Gosh, I don't know anything about university. Dropped out a long time ago. But before we start talking to Ali, Greg, we got to go get crazy here with TCPI.com. Greg, TCP. That's right. TCP, we're going to talk horticulture lighting today, and they have that product. They have faster growth, higher yields is what you get. TCP science-backed horticulture lights. They're lightweight, easy to install, balanced color spectrum, and they're compatible with their TCP smart stuff, which allows you to control schedules and intensity from your smartphone. Make it easy. Do everything you need to right there. Go to tcpi.com. That's right. Of course, proud members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. I think we have a convention coming up, Greg. It goes back and forth with all the stuff going on, mask mandates and travel restrictions and all this sort of stuff. But we're going to try to pull something off for you in early November. So go to the website and check it out. But for right now, welcome to the show, Ali. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First question, how many languages do you speak? I don't speak five languages. So basically, there, there are five languages that I speak broken. So, okay. and, you know, English is one of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I barely speak English as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was researching your website a little bit and looking at it, something stuck out to me. Um, and I, I did this yesterday. I was trying to find it out today, but I couldn't find exactly where I saw it. But I loved it. And it really resonated with me. You wrote, and it could have been on social media, but it, Helio Spectre wrote, not, we're not just selling a light, we're continuing to support and aid as we learn together. And I think that's what, you know, in the lighting industry, what we found is, you know, a lot of people are just selling the light and moving on. You, you're, you're selling it and saying, hey, we don't, I, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but we don't know everything about this light yet, but we're going to learn and aid and go together as we learn together. Is, is that where you guys are at with the LED grow lights? I think that's that's a mindset we should all have if you want to work with the grow lights, you know. So, as as a company, since the respect I started as a research company, we sort of kind of work with the kind of putting together a body of knowledge when it's come to lighting and horticulture. We are actually one of the first companies actually started working with LED lighting in the horticulture back in two thousand six, as a research company. So we were just working for finding, you know, answer to some simple questions like what is the best light for any crop to grow in the most optimal way. So for that, you know, we have been doing a research for more than 15 years. We still keep our toes on the, on the research. And I think we can, it's a never ending uh, story because more we do, more we explore, more we work with our customers and the, you know, partners, more we learn about how different crops respond to the, to, to life basically. So, in, and that's our motto. In, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I like that. And in 2006, LED was yes. not commercialized. It was the beginning stages of everything. When did you actually have product? So our first product, uh, that's a quite a good, good question, a good story behind it, because uh, the, the first question we had was 2012. And the reason, the only reason we developed that product was for our own research. Being a research company, for four or five years, we did a lot of work on the finding, understanding about how the different plants respond to the different type of a spectrum of light, this is a quantity of light. We realize there is not actually a trustworthy LED light out there that we can actually use for our own research. So the first product we developed was actually only for our own research, but the quality was so good that other university asked for it. And then once other university asked for it, there was also at the same time a wave of uh, growing indoor medical cannabis in US. So all of a sudden there were customers asking for the light that we developed for our own purpose and since then, we're sort of commercializing our, our, our solution, our products. 
So who, who paid for you guys to do all of this research in the, in the initial that's, stage? That, you know, we are in Sweden. Sweden is a very much uh, of an innovation driven country. You know, the government s spends billions on just innovation and creativity. So basically the first when the company funded, of course, we got a lot of grants by the government at first uh, to just really help us do our research with our research questions and everything. Uh, and then eventually we, we there are a lot of we attracted a lot of investors to the company and uh, in 2014 we went public and uh, now we have of course access to the capital out in the market so we have actually the three or actually two main investors that we have in the company they've been with the company for over 12 years and that's actually wow. quite a good sign that uh, we have a quite a sturdy investors and that they really believe in what we are doing believe in what we are providing to the industry and they are here for we are here for the long term so basically we're playing the kind of a uh, infinite game let's say put it that way do they does the government of sweden still fund any research or is it all now that you're public absolutely it's all with the investors they still do no 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 it's still it's still we get grants because because as i said our core has been in the research and finding answer to questions and uh, we are still getting a lot of support with the energy uh, associations here in, in, in Sweden for performing different type of research. And the whole is, idea is about how how can we just produce with a more sustainable solution? I mean, it's, uh, sustainability is actually overarching dr drive when it's come to our, our, our solutions at the end. Basically, we want to have the same crop grow with a better quality, but of much less natural resources, which is in the terms of electricity. And for that, go, uh, Swedish government does a lot of, uh, put a lot of resources on that. Not to mention Canada, US, there are a lot of grants out there for doing on the, working on the sustainability. And that initial product you had, how much, is it still in use or has it changed a lot? I assume it's changed some. No, 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 <laughs> it would change a lot actually. I mean, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the first product we had is actually, you need to have two people at least to just even carry it. The, the solution that we are offering today, one person can just with one hand can just hang it to wherever it is. So no, absolutely it has changed. I think we had, when we, from the time that we had our first product to the first commercialized product, I think we had at least seven, eight different revisions. And of course, oh. since 2014 till now, we, we improved the same product with based on the same concept going forward. What's the longest standing install you have in place still is there one you know from 14 that's still going today with the original fixture i think the the, the original fixture we have actually installed since 2012 so nine years and uh, they're going strong still and uh but mm -hmm. the, our commercialized version of our products we have installation since 2013 2014 till now wow so what is it what do you guys say as the biggest selling point of LED grow lights or so, you know, high pressure sodium is, was the standard for years, metal halide. I think there's some fluorescence even, but what's the biggest selling point of LED? I think the first selling point for LED in general is uh, the amount of energy consumption. So you can, you can get the same amount of light or even more with a less amount of electricity. And the reason being is, is not because, you know, HPS has been wrong or anything, but uh, the, the whole, physics of the HPS is that the main part of the electricity that you use in HPS light turn to heat, not to electric, not to light, basically. Whereas LEDs doesn't do it that, that, that way. LED also create heat, but not as much as HPS light does physically, because it's a diode, you know, and the current goes there. So the first thing is that actually the amount of energy saving you're going to get based on the amount of light. But the main part, which is actually where our focus in Helio Spectra is part, part of, is that so you can manipulate light. You can create light. In Helio Spectra, we have lights that you can create light that is actually exactly the same spectrum of light you can get in India, you can get in Canada, you can get in Africa, because it's a variable spectrum light that we have. And let's just say that if you have a product that the seeds is actually coming from, let's say, Colombia, let's say we are talking about a cannabis plant, for example, the seeds coming from Colombia, we can stimulate this, the seeds and we can provide the, that seed, that plant with the same light that you're going to get in Colombia. And that's actually the, the kind of a flexibility that the LED is going to provide for you, which we never get with HPS or any other technologies. What Ali's saying, Greg, is that you can grow your own cocaine now in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but... Uh... <laughs> 
you can grow you any crop. You don't need basically. to import it anymore. Um, you know, so uh, <laughs> okay, I have a lot of notes here, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent here, Ali, because sure. I have a theory. Um, I saw light bulbs every day, so I'm not a scientist, but I've talked to a lot of different scientists and business people in in the grow space and the health effects space. And I think, I think you made a little bit of an error, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but I think it's not a good idea to think of heat and light as different things. I think heat and light are very much the same thing, and so it just depends on how you look at it. Okay, you're talking about waves of energy or whatever. Um, That's correct. And, yeah, and, and so, I, I, you know, when people say, I think heat can be helpful in growing and in different things. So we have a lot of talk about the health effects of lighting. We have a lot of talk about um, improving human wellness, um, Growing plants, we spoke to another gentleman that told us you can literally tune uh, fixtures to make uh, tomatoes taste better. You can you can do all manner of things with light now to to improve crop yields, to grow bigger crops. You can you can do all sorts of things, and that's wonderful. But what I, what I'm what I'm and then we speak to Li-Fi people, Greg. We speak to people about putting you know internet signals into light and all this sort of stuff. And I think what what's really that we need to discover is there is a meta language in light. Light has information in it. And when we <laughs> shine light on things, we tell something to those living things. We send That's them messages. Correct. And that is the language of God, my friend. And if we can really figure out what to, to de... Like you say, you, you barely speak five languages. Well, this is the challenge of your career because if you can learn to speak this language... All magic, all problems. We can solve so many different problems if we actually learn what those light and energy and heat waves are saying. And I, I'm using the, the terminology of speaking and the, uh, you know, the logos in a sense. That idea of the information connecting to us. You know, why does the earth revolve around the sun? Because the, the light tells it to. No, it's because of gravity. Well, maybe you can make up that force, but something is sending a signal to do something with light. And so <coughs> I think, Ali, if we can figure this out, uh, what that language is, forget about health effects and growing stuff, all of those problems will be solved. Energy creation, um, crop yields, uh, human health and wellness. It's like you're, we're all going, trying to, we're trying to find the Rosetta Stone from different directions. Does that make sense? You know, I have to say, it is a really nice segue. I have to say that, uh, first of all, we are working with that, uh, kind of speaking to the crop, which I'm going to get into as we go forward. But, you know, my inability of speaking any language perfectly and also living in a majority of my life i lived in countries that don't speak the language you know and uh, so I, I had to come but i learned we, we learned how to communicate on your first point you're absolutely right heat and light they both are energy basically so electricity is a type of energy you can just turn it to heat turn it to uh, light and then the purpose of light is creating light by its name so uh, with the LED, we're going, we're going to do it more purposefully. And you're absolutely right also that uh, with a sense that uh, you can just change the morphology of the crop based on the type of a light you're going to put the crop or the environment you create for the crop. Give you one example. We have a customer here in Sweden who produce arugula. Uh, you know, arugula, if you go to Mediterranean uh, kind of places, arugula tastes almost like bitter, a lot of mm -hmm. spicy, I would say. Yep. Whereas you, if you have arugula in Toronto, because I tried in Toronto mm -hmm. or in Sweden, they don't taste so much. And that is what the consumer in Toronto, they like it. That's why the consumers in Sweden, they like it. So our customer manage with our own light. We call them light strategy, which is a recipe of light. It means that mm -hmm. uh, in the morning, you wake up the plant with a certain spectrum. In the noon, another spectrum. Afternoon, and then you're going to have an end of line kind of treatment different type of light. Basically, you simulate the sun. You can actually have different type of flavor on the same seed, same environment, with just only light. We have actually, we're producing, our customer producing arugula, which is actually catered to the taste and flavor of the Mediterraneans. And also arugula that is catered to the Swedish kind of flavor. Body. And that's only happened with only a spectrum of light, nothing more. And uh, okay, if whether it is work of God or not, that's that's another thing that we need to discuss. And then, interesting thing that you said about speaking, which is as I said, this is something we try to do. You know, the core knowledge and technology of heliospectra is that uh, 
we are developing a sensor. We have been developing this sensor since 12 years ago. Not that we can just measure the top of a light, because that's out there. We know that what light is out there. But we can actually communicate to the crop. So in a different stage of the crop, crop can say that, if you want me to just grow longer, please provide me this type of light. Or if you want me to just have this flavor, or I got a cold like a human, I have a disease coming to me, crop can communicate and we can read based on our sensor technology that we have, is patented technology that we are, we are developing. We can communicate with the crop, say that, what do you need as, as, as of right now? So we can provide you with the resources that can grow that way. I think that is actually quite, you, you were very spot on to saying that uh, this is absolutely important because you can have a full control over your quality. You can have a full control over your operation. You can foresee and for kind of uh, pre, uh, predict how the production would be. And that's how it's going to work out. And that is actually the sensor technology. We call it biosensor in, in, uh, in heliospectra that we are developing. So the, this uh, arugula example, I just like to, you know, yeah. you, you can grow them. Are you growing them side by side in the same facility? or Same facility, same, same room. Area? Same, same room, room okay, just so a little, like a couple of meters apart, yeah. Without getting too wild on details, what, what does it go? Does it, is it just a Kelvin temperature and intensity change? On the one that's a Mediterranean, like it gets bluer and hotter, or how, how, what, kind of define that if you can in Kelvin temp. We don't change the temperature, so irrigation is the same, temperature is the same. The only thing we change is actually the the kind of a, a spectrum of lights on the different scenarios, because you know if you look at uh, crops, crops the the you know we human we like green light basically. When you look at the bright, is actually the green light that we're we are uh, reflecting about, right? Crop is, they're looking at a four nanometer to 700 nanometer. We call it PAR. Basically, PAR stands for, I guess, photosynthetic uh, active radiation, which is actually almost like a started from blue, a little bit of a light ultraviolet towards red, that is spectrum. So each a spectrum, red, blue, white, and far red even, which is part of, far is out of the PAR, but all of these give provide different signals to the crop. And the and that's different light that we have in different type of latitude in the earth. They have a different mixture of this spectrum. That's why you get the flavor. That's why this particular chemical compound produce in the crop to create flavor. So if you can provide the same spectrum that we get in Italy out of Sweden in the greenhouse, and the, the same spectrum in the Sweden, in Sweden, you're gonna get two different sets of flavor set for the same crop same product so with uh, as uh, mike mentioned light is not just about the source of energy it's also a source of a lot of information give you one more example i just want to touch base a little bit about morphology i guess you go to shops you can see a lot of like basil that they sell in pots and some of them is in the sleeve when you have far red far red of course provide an information as mike said to the crop saying that uh, uh, Dear crop, dear basil, you are already actually overshadowed by some other crop. When the crop is overshadowed, what they do in order to reach the, reach the light, what do you think they do if they're overshadowed? Could take the shadow out? No, they move. <laughs> they move it? They yeah. move, except yeah. they stretch themselves. They stretch themselves to find the light, right? <laughs> and far it provides that signal. So if you can bring far it at the right time in the right amount, right time of the day and the right amount, we can actually tell the crop that you need to stretch. So you're going to get a longer basil rather than a bushy basil. So that is how you, not just a flavor, but also morphology you can actually uh, basically control. And that's, then you're going to have a consistent product every day. So that's how, how the combination with the flavor, everything is the same. Everything is controlled only with light. And the top of light is strategy we're going to uh, provide for the crop. What is the, the most challenging crop? Hmm, that's a good question. Every crop has their own challenges, I have to say. I mean, the challenges are different. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, there is the most... Uh, it's hard to answer such a question because it's not... Uh, it depends on the aspect we're talking about. Some of the crops are, I mean, very much light-hungry crops, like tomato, for example. You can put as... Or cannabis. You can put as much as light. You're going to get the yield in a way. Maybe you compromise on the quality, flavor, and all of those. Some crops are very, very sensitive to the, to, the, to the type of a light. 
And those lighter that is, and also amount of light, those lights are much more challenging because you need to be very much exact on the amount of light that you're exposing those crops. And also the type of a light that you're exposing, the quality of light, the spectrum. So it depends. It's a very much of a, every, every crop is different in a way. What about grapes? Wine? Oh, I mean, basically every single crop in the world, they need to light. But whether there is a business case for growing like grapes using LEDs, uh, that is not there. But obviously you can. You can do any crop in, the, in a closed environment. I always, I hear the most about leafy greens that are the most yes. successful in this space. You don't hear a lot about deep-rooted plants doing as well with this. There's something with the soil um, of, say, Bordeaux that is in the flavor of the wine. Um, you, you mostly hear about, you know, uh, fruits like um, strawberries or leafy greens that do very well in this. Um, this sensor of yours, what kind of information um, is it? Is it reading the plant? Is there what is it? What is exactly is the is the, like I use the words of language to describe what light is doing as a meta language, so to speak. What is the information coming back to you as? How is that information coming back to the sensor? That's a very good question. What we look at is actually the fluorescent signal that the crop is creating. So all of us, we are creating, we have some fluorescence. Uh, actually, we create fluorescence. And uh, our sensor, instead of looking at it, you know, because there are a lot of different ways you can just look at the plant. We are not talking about looking. We are talking about the speaking. Looking at the plant, you can look at the image processing. You know, there are a lot of uh, technologies out there. What we do is that we measure the, the shape of this uh, fluorescent signal, the amount of the fluorescent signal. We know based on the 13, 14 years of research that the different shape of the signal means different thing, means different level of maturity. We can uh, understand whether the crop is under stress, biotic stress or non-biotic stress, too much heat, too little water, too much light, or even diseases. So we know the shape of these uh, basically fluorescent signals. With our, uh, with our sensor, but basically what we do is that uh, we, ins we excite the crop a little bit with the blue light, and then we're gonna measure the signal eventually. And based on the signal we receive, the shape of the signal, we understand with what the stage the crop is. So that is how we are communicating. The medium is actually the fluorescent signal. Why are you not studying humans? I mean, I, I think this is not hideous. Probably other companies are doing that anyway. I mean, that, that, like, there, what, what you're, I don't think that what the, the technology you're talking about only applies to plants. I mean, I think there's a, I think you could probably use this phosphorescent energy to see if people are sick. Um, they do that. Do they? I mean, yes. if you look at the kind of, absolutely, it, it, you know, there's a lot of, there's a body of knowledge on the CMOS, you know, like a, the sensor that is used for diagnosis. So they can take a sample from, your saliva or mm. blood or whatever and in that but that is a, this always happened in a very much of a closed environment so you mm. get a sample and the cartridge you put it in a machine probably somewhere mm -hmm. it's a closed environment and then they measure and this is a very much known uh, technology that they do in a in a kind of different type of diagnosis around the world mm. i'm just i'm just like thinking about this uh, what you're telling me and and you know it's uh, because i interview so many people about lighting and about the science of yeah. light, about health effects of light. Um, you know, the, what none of them have spoken the way you have about, you know, being able to receive signals back. You know, if, if, we're, if we're going to improve yields, like you're looking at the plant, you're saying, okay, you know, you, know, you need to dial back this, or you need to, the plant is asking for more of this. Right? Spot on, There's, exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, and it's telling us because of it's sending this signal out. Um, do the plants, and this is going to say, we're going to get a little woo-woo here. Do, do the plants want something? Do they, are there, is there like a desire for something that they want that sometimes you don't give to them so that they can create flavor? Like, do they ask for things that you don't give them? <laughs> oh, so first of all, I'm not an agronomist. I'm not yeah, an expert sure. in this field. But all I can say is that uh, the, the question is yes. I mean, you can direct the plant. Let's just say that if you're looking for the, for the fruit, you want to just plant, develop fruit rather than the stems and uh, just stay in the vegetative stage. So the plant, whatever you feed the plant, they're going to respond to it at the end. Healthy, healthy food come to our body, we, we become healthier in general. So, but with, with light, what you can do is that you can actually send a signal to the plant that this is actually the kind of a nutrition you're going to get out of light 
to produce fruits rather than produce leaves or stems. I think that is, but again, I'm not, a, I cannot go to detail to that because I'm not an expert in this field, but the answer, the simple answer to your question is yes. You can just provide a plant with any light, any crop gonna grow, grow under any light, but whether that quality of the crop at the end is what you're looking for, you need to define, you need to be much more accurate with your light to just make sure, if you're talking about, for example, cannabis, if you're looking for THC amount and CBD amount or how large your, your flower should be, there is a different type of a strategy, light a strategy you need to have, rather than just want to have the biggest cannabis plant on earth, which is actually, that means that the, the plant has been in a vegetative stage in a long time. So you can define that for the crop with light only. So now bringing this out to the real world, I, I read on your website, you have six continents that you have business in. Which one are you missing? Uh, if I, if I, my geography is right, right, Mike? Antarctica. Seven continents. <laughs> I don't think actually, so. we have, have Antarctica. We have Antarctica. No, we are we are everywhere. All right, uh, we'll change that website no. to seven then. <laughs> yeah, we maybe should. Antarctica. I'm thinking about. That, no, we have yeah, that. We I'm have doing. that. We have we have we have, our light is in South Pole. We have our light in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, in in uh, South America, North America. So what do I miss? Oh, Oceania. Australia. Yeah, I mean, I think. Yeah, yeah. we have that. Yeah. So right. maybe we should. Do we have seven continents? I think so. <laughs> I have to double check myself, but I thought it was seven. Yeah. But anyways, you're all over the all place. Right. So, um, yeah. How, how do you guys go to market? Is it all? Are all customers buying direct from Helio Spectra? Are they buying through distribution? A combination? How do you do it? I know everywhere is probably different, but so we we are you know our approach even to go to market is very much related to science as weird as it sounds, right? Because we know that due to the latitude, due to the different environment, due to the different climate, different markets, let's say Canada, requires a certain type of light. So because we are so accurate in what we are providing, we make sure that we develop a product for that certain market. Obviously you can have like a, a product that fits everywhere. As I said, you can put any light, any crop under any light, it's gonna grow. But we are not only for looking for growth, we're looking for quality. We're looking for accelerating the harvest time. We're looking for actually controlling the consistency of the crop. So basically the way that we approach markets is that, of course, we look at the potential, but also we, we make sure that we have a product that fits that particular market, the, re, the light requirement of that particular market, and then we enter that market and going forward. So, yeah. yeah go well, when you, when, you call, when you call it a market though, like. Take Canada, for example, because it's Mike's favorite country. Um, Toronto has a very different climate than <laughs> Vancouver, right, Mike? Yeah, Canada's a bad example <laughs> for this. <laughs> it's too Canada's or enormous. Even... I mean, you know, it's uh, Ontario is bigger than Spain and France put together. Um, you know, Quebec is bigger than Germany, Spain, and France. So, I mean, it, it's a huge country. But, yes, I, I, get, I get what he's saying. It's local characteristics matter. With this, what you're is what you're saying. The local, even in the U.S., I mean, there's huge very difference. different. Yeah, and also depends on the, what market we want to enter. So, mm -hmm. if you're talking about greenhouse, greenhouse light becomes a supplemental light. But when we talk about indoor, really doesn't matter where it is located, as long as you have temperature, humidity, and control. Doesn't matter if you're in Dubai, or in Kenya, or in Canada. These uh, because there is then then the light becomes the sole source of lighting. So when the majority of our product is like, I would say 60, 70% is actually working in the indoor environment and then 30, 40% is actually for the greenhouses. What I mentioned to you was about the greenhouse when the, we have like a supplemental light, LED as a supplemental light, which is very important to understand what is the light they say is available there and what is that you want to supplement based on the heliospectral light. So that is how, that's what I meant. But for the indoor growing facilities is mainly towards what type of product you want to grow. You mentioned microgreens, you might say lettuce, cannabis, whatever that might be. Then we have a particular product for that, product, product, particular solution for that. The, uh, you're, you, do you sell by subscription? Like, do you sell like, um, like a monthly fee? Like the, the equipment and the software and all that go in and then you charge the customer a monthly fee? Or do you charge them like as a capital expense up front? It's more of a uh, you know, capital expense right now on, on a light, a light solution. But since we have a software called Helio Core, you know, I never mentioned. So if you, if you look at light, if I just provide you with a light, 
is like as if I provide you a car without a steering wheel. Mm -hmm. yeah. With Helio Core that we have, we provide you with a steering wheel. Means that you can kind of navigate where the crop should go, should should go, and so on. So for Helio Core, we have a subscription model, uh, a recurring revenue model. But on top of that, also we have something called Helio Care. So on the car with a steering wheel, we also teach you how to drive. So actually we work with our growers. That's why we need to kind of, we are very much, our business model is very much about engaging with the growers, doing it together, make sure they can get the best result out of the solution they're gonna get out of Helio Spectra. So we have different models. For the light, obviously it's transactional, very much capital. And uh, then we have subscription model for software uh, uh, to our customers. When you, um, where are the fixtures made? In Sweden. They're made in Sweden. Oh. In Sweden, south of like a three hours drive from where our office is. So we're talking about very expensive light fixtures, Greg. <laughs> Straight out of Sweden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds expensive. But, Made in uh, Sweden. You don't yeah. see that a lot. Um, actually, Sweden's not that big a country, though. People, you know, when people talk about Sweden, they think it's like a big country. What are people, four million people in Sweden? How many people are in Sweden? Ten million people. Ten million, yeah. It's a small country. And it's pretty... I would say that, yeah, there's a population, yes, but the, the kind of area is quite large because, you know, the south of Sweden is actually where I would say that, I think again, where the around, uh, we end up around North UK, I would say. But yeah. then if you just take the south and they just turn around Sweden, you end up with the south of Italy. So it's pretty long country hmm. with a different type of lights and a different type of climate. Sure. So in, the, in that sense, the area is quite large, but not so much populated. Yep, most people live in the south so, of Sweden. That's cool. Yeah, there you go. That makes sense. <laughs> so, like Canada, I have never. Yeah, I, I've never done a, a, a any project like this. So, excuse me if I'm saying it wrong, but let's say somebody has currently has an uh, indoor greenhouse facility, and they're growing arugula, tomatoes, and cannabis. I know that's not likely, but let's just say, right now in the past, what they've done is put in high pressure sodium light across all of them, right? probably most common and all the same intensity all on the same times and get, or maybe they change it a little bit, but either way, that's what they do. When you go in there now, do you give them three different light fixtures or is it all the same fixture, just giving different spectrums? A uh, good question. Depends on the crop. First of all, probably that per se grower doesn't grow tomato because tomato, the business case for tomato growing indoor is not there yet, but let's just stick to the arugula and, and cannabis. For sure. arugula, we always recommend the variable spectrum that we have. In HPS, what you get is that the same spectrum all the time, but you, you're gonna, you can turn on and turn off the light. With LED technology that we have, you can dim up and dim down the light, but also you can change the spectrum during the day. And that is something that our software will do. So it depends on the setup that it is there. Some of the, for example, let's just use cannabis as an example. Some of the cannabis growers, they use two different rooms, one for vegetative and the other one is for the flowering uh, process. So for that, we are bringing two different lights for them with a two different light strategy and so on. But if they want to grow in one room, we have a variable spectrum light that can actually create the vegetative spectrum that is needed on the phase that is crop is growing the stems and everything, and then eventually switch to flowering spectrum at the end. So it depends on the what type of a grower we are dealing with and we can just bring the whole solution to them and, and you talk about the whole solution that that's a fixture and the software and you, you mentioned the steering wheel are there customers right now that just say i'm going to buy the fixture and do whatever i want with it or are, i'm assuming Absolutely. you say they do okay but to yeah me, they do be, but uh, you need the software i would think to make it work properly. i mean Again, we have in our portfolio, we have a particular light that is called Mitra. Obviously, Mitra is like you can just use it as the only dimmable light because the fixture, the, the kind of a spectrum is fixed. You can dim up and down the light as much as you want. And that is something that uh, the growers have the full control with. But if the same grower wants to do a little bit extra, we are talking about cannabis again. If you want to have like extra in the controlling your terpenes, THC, CBD content and everything, then we are offer uh, suggesting a variable spectrum light. It's like, a, you know, you buy beer, any brand of beer, and then you have this kind of microbrewery type of beer that is as a, a specific flavor, depends on the customer. We actually cater those customers. You don't necessarily need to have software in every single installation, 
but that depends on what you want to get out of your production. But eventually, I believe that uh, we, we should uh, bring control and automation as much as possible to this industry, because if you can't compare horticulture with the industry like automotive, mining and everything, automation and control is developed way ahead in, in automotive industry with robots and everything. And mm -hmm. horticulture is starting to getting there. So if you want to be like a really game changer here, we would like to give the control as much as possible to the growers who just get the control over the quality of the crop and the yield that they want to get out of it. So do, do these growers do their own research or do they count on you? Like, let's say I don't, I, I have never done any growing and I want to start a, a plant. Can I go to you and say, help me grow this arugula? We're going to call it that. <laughs> How do you do it? I mean, as I said, we have a, we have a, we have a solution. We have a package called Helio Care for, for, okay. to cater to those growers. We kind of hold your hand for two years, three years, depends on the contract. We make you, make you very comfortable with your production. And then we leave, we leave you with, with your own production. If you don't have any experience, of course you pay for it and we provide that knowledge for you. But majority of the growers are dealing with the very experienced growers, they call them head grower, for example. They already have experience with HPS, already have experience with the growing in a just, just a sun and everything. And so they understand the crop in a way. And uh, with those growers, we are basically our experts and the head grower to talk to each other, making sure that everything is intact. So it is much easier for them to adapt to technology that we're providing. One of the reasons why people talk about cannabis so much in this space is that when the legalization, like so Canada was the first, one of the first countries to legalize marijuana, not to decriminalize it, legalize it across the entire country. That's, there's different, there's a whole argument about decriminalization versus legalization, which is not appropriate for the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast, but those are major differences. There's a huge difference between decriminalizing a drug and legalizing it. But anyway, um, you know, America started with states le um, decriminalizing it. Canada legalized it across the board. And what we've seen is um, <clears throat> boutique cannabis shops opening everywhere. Okay. And there's a point here that gets to it. Um, and the cost of cannabis going down. Um, excuse me. So... Cannabis being a high value crop per yeah. whatever acre, whatever the metric is in, in, in that horticultural space. I think growing leafy greens is a waste of commercial real estate. Like I don't think you could make money in Toronto um, leasing a facility, buying Swedish made lights, <laughs> <laughs> installing some crazy software and growing arugula. You gotta grow pot or cocaine. They gotta legalize cocaine in order for this to become affordable. Because, you know, people want to pay two bucks for a package of arugula. They don't want to pay, like you pay 50 bucks for a little tiny jar of whatever, you know, I don't know, Greg, whatever, uh, pills or oils or whatever. And it, it, that, that comes from like a tiny f square inch of the growing space in a facility, whereas arugula is going to be all over. The, how many salads can you make per <laughs> square foot? I, I don't see the business case there yet. And uh, do, do some of your customers struggle with that? Like, how do they get around that? There just isn't the money per square foot that cannabis offers. So that's why you talk about that's cannabis so much, right? Because everybody that's making money is growing cannabis. Yeah, so I think. How do you, yeah, go the, ahead. The, the, the simple, yeah, the simple answer would be: instead of thinking of square foot, you need to food. You think about cubic foot, okay. because once you have arugula, once you have herbs and everything. You're using the space rather than just using the area. Mm -hmm. Because you can grow on the tiers, you can do multi tiers, you can just have tiers very close to each other. These crops are that's huge, they're like a 20, 30 centimeter. So you can grow them in a very much of a compact environment. So the amount of crop you get, you're gonna get per square meter, because now you're using the kind of a, the third uh, axis as well, is much, much higher than, the, than when you grow in a traditional way. So that's, that's one of the benefits of growing indoor. And that's why the, the, all those uh, real estate costs that you need to bear actually make sense. But you mentioned a very good point, whether all of these growers, because we provide, we have solution for vertical farming, basically, that you can grow very much compact, you know, crops, herbs, salads, and everything. Uh, you have a very good point about whether these, these companies are making money. Yeah, some of them are struggling, some of them are very successful. But let's just focus on those that are successful. What they nail is, they nail 
the type of a crop they want to grow. They did their job very well with the supply chain. So when they basically distribution system and everything, all of these are playing the role. And most importantly, which is actually the number one, is that they nailed the technology. So they have the right light, they have the right uh, automation and control system, they have the right, infra right infrastructure with the aircon, with the HVAC and everything in there. And then, then they're, you're gonna start making money because let's just say that uh, if you wanna grow any certain crop, let's just say arugula in our example, because apparently we like arugula, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, if you grow it in a, in a greenhouse, once you go to the vertical farming, basically you can grow up to six, seven, ten times more crop based on the same area, but also you reduce the risks because it's a controlled environment, it's a closed environment, so there is not human going in and out. And uh, so you reduce the risk of losing your crop because of diseases. But also the other thing is that uh, because I hear that a lot, especially in a, uh, in a very like countries like uh, UAE, Dubai, for example, city. The, everybody say that okay there is a sun here sun is free of charge but sun is extremely expensive because you need to manage the sun because once you have the sun once you have exposing yourself to the sun you need to take care of the heat you remember the part of the energy we discussed in the beginning so you need to take care of that heat that means that you need to consume more electricity to cool down your environment and once you expose your operation facility to the basically air flow and everything you are inviting diseases, you're inviting aphids. So if you put all of this together in your business case, so basically if you nail the technology, if you have your supply chain working really well and you choose the right crop, it's actually quite a profitable business. You know, what, you know what's interesting is that, um, so I visit a lot of farms. I have farm clients. Most of them are not indoor growing companies. They are farms, but they, you know, whatever, they have lighting and they have large buildings and that that I, I go and visit them and, and talk to them about their lights. But what you'll notice is that Canada, uh, when, the, when the pandemic, um, I don't want to get into too much about that. I got very strong feelings about the, the, uh, the current situation yeah, same in here. Canada. Same here. Okay. I know Sweden's doing much yeah. better. Um, I saw a press release from the whatever. We'll just call him the Viking guy over there that runs the health ministry. But anyway, uh, so we, uh, uh, you know, you go to a farm. And what you find is that Canada um, imports uh, low-cost labor to farms, yeah. okay, every year. And last year was a big crisis. We can't bring the farm workers in. They have COVID, all this sort of stuff. And, like, the farmers came out and said, hey, dudes, this is going to seriously impact our food supply. Okay? So forget about COVID for a second. If we don't get these people from the Caribbean, the, you know, good people, they come up to work for the summer, they're going to make a good living, they live on the farm, and then they go back with a couple thousand bucks Canadian in their pocket, everybody wins. We need these people to come up here and pick this fruit and this, these vegetables, otherwise they're going to rot in the field, and we're going to have bigger problems than COVID-19, bud. And so all of a sudden, the government says, well, okay, no problem. Those, those COVID people can come in and live in this big building. So they let them all in, and they did the farming and all this sort of stuff. But what's interesting is you're talking about completely altering that dynamic from a farm worker being a low-skilled person to being a high-knowledge worker. That's very, you, very interesting to me, actually. It inverts the whole business actually, model. You, yeah, you hit the nail. Because I, I actually discuss a lot. I have a blog on my LinkedIn, I talk a lot about socioeconomy aspect of the whole vertical farming, for example, because if you look at the vertical farm, the first thing from the, the government point of view, the moment you say that uh, you're going to cut down your labor from 19 to 9 or from 40 to 5, for example, because you're running in the vertical farm, you think about, OK, we, we lose it. We cut down the number of jobs available. However, on the other hand, the same type of technology create skilled worker so mm -hmm. basically you're going to have much more skilled people in, the, in order to run these farms mm -hmm. and eventually through generation you're going to have a much more skilled growers in the future rather than today so you don't you don't need to maybe have you know uh, because today the, the picking up is it's not so much a skill you need it so you have some certain skill you can get trained for half a day and then you're going to start going picking the crops and picking the fruits and everything mm -hmm. but eventually you're going to we, we are going to have much more skilled and also this whole technology going to grow to just create more jobs but not in the same sector maybe another sector more technology driven sectors and more jobs in, in that aspect but you hit the nail on that yeah the, the so when people talk 
you know, the, the new, what do they call those people? The new, um, the, the weavers, where they automated the weaves, the, the new Luddites, okay, that are always worried about mm-hmm. productivity. Productivity never lowers jobs, okay? I got news for everybody yes. listening, okay? Yeah, like, can we just get over it? It's been 300 years of this nonsense or whatever. Productivity mm-hmm. never reduces the employment and only raises everybody's wages, okay? Exactly. And so if you, if you have a free market, now, that's not being said. Google and Facebook are not in the productivity business. They're in the distraction business. So they're not creating true productivity, okay? Helio Spectra would be, making a pro, uh, would be increasing human productivity. Facebook reduces productivity. Okay? It wastes everybody's time. So there's different, not all businesses create productivity, but when you recognize a productivity improvement, you embrace it. And then you allow the free markets, the companies to train those workers um, to do those jobs. You let the companies do it because they have a specific outcome they're looking for. And if a company goes to Helio Spectra, they give Helio Spectra <coughs> money. Helio Spectra gives them the lights. The company grows the arugula. The company worries about sending it to the Walmart or the, the grocery store or the market. And that's how everything works, Greg Eric. And when we start interfering with this crap, where people, you know, they don't want productivity because then the Mexicans that come in Canada are going to not have their job. It's just like, it's complete nonsense. So I love what you're doing, Ali, and I thank you for you, any, being a guest on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. That's an amazing company you have. Is it traded on the uh, uh, NASDAQ? Absolutely. NASDAQ First North, yes. Uh, it's a NASDAQ in Stockholm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's exactly. in Stockholm. That's okay. Great. So you, all you listeners out there, get off Bitcoin, get on the... Uh, NASDAQ Europe and buy some HLSPY. That's a stock symbol. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Everybody's trading Bitcoin, but uh, I don't know. I don't understand. You know, as I, I'm, this is a get a grip on Lenny podcast, but I'm gonna make, I have a lot of beefs. <laughs> Cryptocurrencies. Okay, just a quick thing before we close it out and go to TCPI.com, Greg. Just a quick thing. Okay. <laughs> yep. Everyone I talk to who buys Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies tells me because they think that the U.S. dollar is going to collapse and Western markets are going to collapse, right? And then they're, you know, what am I going to do when the U.S. dollar is worth nothing? And I always say to them, like, do you really think that there's going to be electricity if the U.S. dollar collapses and the U.S. economy collapses, <laughs> right? So where's your Bitcoin going to be? It's going to be in a computer that doesn't have any power. Folks, thanks for listening to the Get a Lightning Podcast. Uh, we thank Ali for coming on the show from Helio Spectre. That was a real thank fun you very talk. Much. Yep. And Greg yeah. Eric, before we go you got to get yeah. crazy first, brother. TCPI.com, the craziest people in lighting. What do they got? Yeah. Well, we talked about it today. The science back toward the cultural lights that are lightweight, easy to install, balanced color spectrum, and it has the smart stuff that allows you to control schedules, intensity, and everything from your smartphone. So check them out. Exactly. Go to TCPI.com. And, of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, the crazy distributors out there. We're trying to make this uh pro- a horticultural thing happen within nailed we'll see maybe we'll do some training greg eric in the ls Let's evolve coming up we're trying to pull off a convention but the the people still want to play cooties so but for right now folks i'm signing <laughs> off i just pissed off the people off and the other half love me so check in the, check us out next week on get a grip on lighting thanks for listening bye for now <laughs>